yeah, we all want low crime, but what are the other ways that we can get at it rather than the expensive route of incarceration? Hi, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer for Reason TV, and today we're talking with Professor Michael Stoll. He teaches public policy at UCLA and is author of the recent book, Why Are So Many Americans in Prison? Michael, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Incarceration rates have skyrocketed since the mid-1970s, uh, but violent crime is at an all-time low. So can you explain the disconnect here and why you think the costs of mass incarceration significantly outweigh the benefits? 30, 40 years ago, we incarcerated in the United States about 100 people per 100,000. But the United States ramped up that incarceration five-fold so that we incarcerate now 500 people per 100,000. So every, every 10, 11 people that you meet, you know, someone's either going to know someone's in prison, has been in prison with a record, or you, or you met them and, they just, and they're going off to prison. That increase that we saw, 80% of that through our analysis was driven by policy changes, not by the increased criminality of citizens in the United States. In fact, crime rates, as you said, has fallen. Um, so all of the increase is driven by mostly increases in sentencing, particularly for violent crime. This is at the state level. And at the federal level, most of it is driven by uh, changes in drug policy um, definitions of offending, as well as high incarceration rates for those that have been found uh, guilty of certain kinds of drug possessions. In layman's terms, I mean, do we have that many dangerous criminals on the street to explain these high incarceration rates? So when you incarcerate um, and you target your enforcement efficiently, you get the most criminally prone first. After that, you start incarcerating what we call the marginal offenders. Those are offenders who are less likely to commit crime repeatedly. And so the bang for the buck that we get in society from incarcerating those individuals falls dramatically. I saw an article that New York City is paying $168,000 per inmate. So can you talk about what's driving these financial costs a little bit more? Um, who, what, what's responsible? Right. Well, I mean, it's all the production of, of prisons, right? So it's not only the, the brick and mortar cost of the facility, uh, which actually f that cost falls over time because it's a fixed cost once you build a prison. So it's the bricks and mortar. Uh, it is the personnel to man the prisons. Right, so that would be security guards, and in California, that's very expensive because the prison union is fairly strong, prison guard union is fairly strong, and wages and benefits are fairly high, and so those are enormous costs. And then those costs vary across states. California is a high cost state; land is expensive, so it's going to be higher than say in Alabama or Mississippi. California also has really terrible conditions. I mean, yeah. they're pouring so much money into these systems, but uh, they've been the conditions have been described as unconstitutional because they're so cruel and unusual. They have been defined by uh, the federal system as being unconstitutional. Uh, the number of people per, um, per state penitentiary is way beyond the capacity, almost by 20, 25 percent. Right, and so one way that the state has been able to maintain or reduce their cost per person is to drive up overcrowding. So the more people that you can get out of prison, you know, you're better able to manage the cost. Uh, but that comes at tremendous, I think, uh, consequence. And you have a different set of prescriptions for prison alternatives. Uh, can you talk about those a little bit? One of the things that I think needs to be done, and we know this is politically difficult, is that there has to be reform in sentencing. And the problem with reform and sentencing is that the political dynamics of sentence reform are asymmetrical. That is, it's, it's easier to get tough on crime than it is to be perceived as getting soft on crimes. But um, there was a window of opportunity when states started to feel the budget crisis as a result of the Great Recession. And, and tax revenues fell dramatically. Uh, states were under pressure to figure out cost savings. And you know, state prisons are eating up an increasing share of general revenue. And so there was a window of opportunity for states to rethink uh, their sentencing. And even in California, we've rethought sentencing. So we've relaxed the stringency on three strikes. And other get tough on crime states like Texas have actually done some sentencing reform, and so has Florida. So we think that has to be on the table no matter how politically difficult. The conversation has to be made in terms of the costs and benefits. Like, yeah, we all want low crime, but what are the other ways that we can get at it rather than the expensive route of incarceration. The other big idea, I think, from the book is that most of the convictions and sentencing take place in uh, smaller political jurisdictional levels than states. So our idea is that counties should have skin in the game, where at some level they're contributing towards the cost of incarceration so that counties 
could be more efficient or more intelligent about whom they send to prison. And if, if it was the case that they had to pay for part of the tab of prison rather than just the state, we think that they would be much more likely to be judicious in who they send to prison. What other interests do politicians have to cater to that makes reforming prison so hard? The other concerns have to do with the stakeholders in the prison industry. I mean, people who work in prisons, who build prisons, all have an interest in having prisons. They play a formidable role in reforming um, either sentencing reform or prison reform. Do you think public perception is shifting at all in terms of how the public is viewing drug offenders? I do think there is a growing plurality of people who would probably agree that there's a, there's a role for prison, but that at some point the bang for the buck diminishes quickly, and that there's other things that we could do with public money to get these same crime-reducing effects. There's one camp that I think thinks in that kind of lens. There's another camp that I think sees it through some notion of justice. So I think the Ballard Initiative approval to be lenient on three strikes was a notion of justice. So that someone who's caught for stealing a bag of chips being sent to prison for the rest of his or her life just seemed utterly ridiculous. And I think a justice argument was probably more in play there than, um, than I think the more uh, fiscal conservative view, which is that, you know, this is money not well spent. We could do something else to get the same goal. Great. Well, uh, thanks, Michael, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. For Reason TV, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer.